Hi folks, uh, in this video I'm going to spend a little bit of time walking through the commands in the creatinine.r script uh, and the corresponding data set is in creatinine.csv uh, which I've already loaded into my r workspace over here so I encourage you to go ahead and do the same thing. Uh, there are really uh, two goals from this script. Uh, one is to use the Gaussian or normal linear regression model to quantify our uncertainty about parameters, in particular the slope and the intercept in the regression model. Uh, and then second, to use that same assumption, again, the assumption of normally distributed residuals, to quantify our uncertainty about predictions. Uh, that is to get prediction intervals that aren't naive, that don't ignore parameter uncertainty in the way that we've been doing so far. Just to remind you about the, the normal linear regression model, uh, it's this simple addition to the basic linear uh, model that we've been assuming so far. Uh, namely, we take the residuals, which we've been calling epsilon i here, and we assume that they come from a normal distribution. Uh, that's an assumption, of course, uh, and more to the point, it's an assumption that buys us something. It's an assumption that allows us uh, to derive from probability calculations what our standard errors of our regression coefficients are, and it allows us to have prediction intervals that take into account that uncertainty about parameters in addition to the uncertainty about a future residual. Uh, and, you know, I've unpacked those assumptions a little bit here, but this is really it. We've got Gaussian residuals. Now let's see what that assumption buys us. So back to the R script. Just walk through this line by line here. The same script I went over in class. You'll want to grab the latest version from the website. Uh, just going to go a bit slower here. So first things first, let me just grab the number of cases in the data set. That's the number of rows in the data frame here, stored in the variable called n. And now let's plot the data. Uh, the two variables here, uh, uh, age on the x-axis here, uh, each dot is a patient here, and uh, this variable labeled create clear, uh, which stands for creatinine clearance. That's a measure of kidney function, and as you can tell, your kidneys get worse as you age. Uh, they do so in a pretty obvious linear trend here. So using the syntax that you've gotten pretty familiar with here, we can fit a linear model, uh, and I should load the mosaic library, that's one thing I forgot to do here. Uh, we should fit a linear model here for creatinine clearance, the y variable, versus age, the x variable. Uh, and now uh, we could ask for the coefficients, the fitted values, the residuals, all the things that you learned how to do. Here's a new function that you may not have encountered before. It's summary. Uh, so LM1 is the model object that stores all this information. And now let's extract some of it. And you're going to see a big screen dump down here. There's a lot of information that won't be familiar. Some of it will be. For example, R squared, we know what that is. Um, Estimates, we know what those are. Those are the least squares estimates of the intercept and the slope. Uh, and here's a, a column labeled standard error. Uh, of course, you know what a standard error is. It's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of this corresponding quantity right here. Uh, but it's not exactly clear what R has done in order to calculate this standard error. Uh, the way we've been calculating standard errors so far is via bootstrapping. Uh, what's going on here is R is using the assumption of normally distributed residuals and applying the formulas that I've given you on a page, page 111 of the course packet, and it just outcomes the standard error. Here it is. Okay, That's for the intercept, and that's the standard error for the slope. Uh, and we're more or less done without having to worry about bootstrapping here. Uh, of course, there's the whole question of whether the assumption of normally distributed residuals is reasonable for this data set, and that's a question of model diagnostics, model checking, that we'll talk about in a later class period. For now, I simply want to emphasize the, the procedure here. Uh, we fit the model, we ask for the summary, and R automatically computes the standard errors from the Gaussianity assumption, or the normality assumption. Uh, just as a sanity check here, let's compare these to the, estimate, uh, the estimates of the standard errors we get from bootstrapping. Okay, so I'm going to do uh, the, the standard bootstrap that we learned uh, in class already. Uh, every bootstrapped resample here is going to be fitting a linear model for creatinine uh, clearance versus age for a resampled version of the original data set. That's my bootstrap resample right there. Uh, and I'll do that a thousand times here in this for loop. So I'll let that go here for a minute or two. Uh, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, once it's done, we can look at a histogram. And there you are. That's the sampling distribution of the age variable uh, from your bootstrap estimate there. Uh, and if you simply ask what's the standard deviation here, uh, the standard deviation of that sampling distribution, we remember we have a word for that. That's the standard error. And so if we compare the estimate of the standard error here, about 0.039, to the estimate of the standard error for the age coefficient from the Gaussian regression model, we can see that, OK, they're not exactly the same, but they are pretty close, uh, you know, within roughly 10 to 15% of one another. Uh, and I can emphasize just if we did the bootstrapping again, uh, we would get a slightly different sampling distribution because of the Monte Carlo error, a slightly different histogram, and a slightly different standard deviation. This one's about 0.038. Uh, so you're getting a sense that the bootstrap standard deviation, the bootstrap standard error here is a bit larger. 
uh, than the, the Gaussian standard error. And you know that's something that uh, you, know, you may notice here and you may wonder, which should I use? Uh, again, that's a question that we'll, we'll punt on for another day uh, in terms of whether you use bootstrapping or the normal linear regression model. Uh, simply here, we're thinking of it as a sanity check. R is reporting that as a standard error. Does that sit well with what we know before about computing standard errors? And it looks pretty close uh, when we check it with bootstrapping. Okay. Uh, and so in terms of parameter uncertainty, that, that is more or less it. Uh, we could compute a confidence interval uh, by, for example, going out two standard errors from the estimate. Uh, and you're getting the sense here that the standard error for the intercept would be pretty narrow, 147 plus or minus two times that. Uh, and the estimate for the slope would be also pretty narrow, you know, minus 0.62 plus or minus two times that. And that'll give us an approximate 95% confidence interval for those two parameters. Uh, the next thing, uh, so that's the first thing, parameter uncertainty. Uh, and the normal linear regression model gives that to us in a very, very straightforward way. Here it is. Uh, equally straightforward, although a little bit more involved in terms of uh, the execution in R syntax, is prediction uncertainty. Okay, so this is the scenario where you have a data set that you fit a model to. Uh, then you're going to see new cases, new x variables, and you want to predict the corresponding y variables. Uh, so I want to show you how that's done here in R. We've, we've done naive prediction intervals so far, uh, simply going out you know, one or maybe two residual standard deviations from the line to get our, our uh, predictive interval. Uh, but that's naive in that, in that it ignores parameter uncertainty. Uh, we want prediction intervals that leverage the assumption of normally distributed residuals in order to bake in all that uncertainty into the predictive interval. So let's see how to do that. Uh, just a bit of bookkeeping first here. So what I'm going to do, we know if I go down here to the console and I type in N, that says there's about 150, well, there are 157 cases in the original data frame. So I'm going to split that into roughly equal size portions here. I'm going to create uh, what I'll call a training set here by sampling a set of cases that are going to go into one data set. Uh, and if I just, you know, what are these? These are, these are all the cases that go into one data set. All the rest are going to go one into, I'll call, a test set. So, you know, we create this using this syntax here. Grab these rows from creatinine, store them in creatinine.train. And then the ones that are left over, which you indicate with this little bit here, minus train set, those go into this other data frame called creatinine.test. So, you know, while this is a bit uh, fictitious here uh, in that we, we've seen all this data before, we want to pretend as though this is the data we've seen right here in creatinine.train, and then the x variables here, the values of age in creatinine.test, correspond to patients that we haven't seen, and we want to predict their corresponding values of the y variable. Okay, So if we now just go back and pretend that creatinine.train is the only data we've seen, we can plot the data just as we did before. Uh, you're going to notice it looks similar in terms of the overall trend. It's half the original data, uh, so things are a bit sparser here, but you're getting the same broad uh, look. Now let's use that training data set uh, to fit a model, right? And you notice now the only difference uh, between here on line 26 and back up to the original linear model on line 7 is that this was to the full data set. And now down here on line 26, that's to the data set with, that only has the quote unquote training cases in it. Okay, so I now fit that linear model and you know now your new friend is the summary function. You could ask for the estimates for the standard errors and because we have less data, the standard errors are bigger here. All right. Now it's up to us to make some predictions on the test set. And the way we do that, very straightforwardly, is with the predict function. So the way this function works is you feed it a past model. So here, LM1, you see it being highlighted up here. That's the model I've already fit. And you notice I only use the training data to fit that model. Now we want to make predictions. Well, for what? New data set. And we, we feed it this creatinine.test. Okay? So this creatinine.test has a column in it uh, for age. And so what this function is going to do, it's going to take the information in this model, take the data in this data frame, combine them together, and fit uh, the predictions. Uh, and it's going to store the result in this variable pred.test. So let's execute that. And now we can plot the predictions. So I'll, I'll uh, plot the, my predicted values of age versus age in the test data set here on line 34. And we can see, uh, quite predictably, they all fall in a straight line because it's a linear model. All right. Now, uh, we could do the naive thing and go up, say, one or two residual standard deviations to get something like a 65% or a 95% prediction interval. Uh, but let's do that here. Uh, and and without, you know, without any uh, sort of further ado, we'll just go straight to the predict function. We're going to add two extra arguments here. So LM1 is the same as it was here. Creatinine.test creatinine is the same as it was on up, he up here. But we're adding two new flags to this function. First of all, we're saying, give us an interval. And what kind of interval? Uh, well, a prediction interval rather than a confidence interval. Okay, And how 
Uh, how confident should we be in that interval? Well, let's have a 95% prediction interval. Uh, and again, we're playing a bit fast and loose with the interpretation of exactly what a 95% prediction interval means from a mathematical perspective. But intuitively, it's very clear. We want to have some interval that gets us the true value with something like 95% certainty. So let's execute this right here, pred2.test. Uh, and so, you know, the difference between pred test, which I'll look at the first several entries here just by typing head of pred.test here in the console, these are just numbers, right? One, three, you know, for case one, case three, case five. Those are their single point estimates for the prediction. Uh, if instead I look at the top five or six rows of pred2.test, you notice now I've got three columns. I've got a fitted value, and those fitted values here, 127, 132, etc., correspond exactly to those predictions up here. But now I've got a range. I've got a lower and an upper endpoint of a prediction interval for the value of the y variable at the x variable for case one here. Okay? So if I you know, want to peel off that first column, I can ask for pred2.test1. So that says, give me all the rows and the first column. Uh, and there they are. Right? I could also do the same for the second column, which would uh, pick out the lower endpoints of those prediction intervals. And there they are. Uh, or I could also do it for the third column, which gives me the upper endpoints of the prediction interval. And there they are, sped out to the console. Uh, so of course, that's sort of limited in use to spit it out to the console. Let's actually plot these things. So I'll plot the first column, which is the predicted value itself versus age. And those are right here. Now I'll plot the lower bounds of the prediction interval, and I'll make them x's by changing the, the point characteristic here. There they are. And now I'll add uh, also in x's the upper bounds of the prediction interval. And there they are. Okay. Uh, and this is a bit annoying over here because the, the prediction intervals kind of go off the, the axis here, both above and below. So I'm going to zoom out here, just change the y limits here by, by making it encompassing the entire range of the prediction. That's on line 49 there. Okay. So now, uh, now I have to add, just as before, the upper and lower bounds of the prediction intervals. And there they are. Uh, it's kind of hard to see uh, here on the plot, but uh, if you were to zoom in here and, and kind of look at, at the width of the prediction interval here versus the width of the prediction interval here, you would actually see that these intervals tend to bow out just a little bit. They're just a tiny bit wider here at the, le the left and right endpoints than they are in the middle, and that's for reasons that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit more depth later. Okay, and now, if that's a prediction interval, of course, uh, we, what we've done here is fit predictions to out-of-sample points, namely points that the model that, was, uh, that we fit here didn't see in terms of, of, of having them as observations available to, to fit the model parameters. All right, so uh, truly out of sample here. Uh, but it's worth seeing, now that we've made these predictions on this test case, let's see what the actual points were. And we do that by the points function here. And I'll put them in red, and I'll make them dots here. Uh, and you're going to notice, now let me zoom in here and, and recenter this, that we've done pretty well. We never saw any of the corresponding y variables that you see in red. We only saw the x variables. Here's our best guess, and on average, we're doing pretty well. Right? Uh, and here's the boundaries of our 95% prediction interval. And if you count here, you know, we sort of miss one there, one there, one there, one there. You know, that's about 4 out of 80. Uh, not so bad if you're aiming for 95%. So uh, you can see that there really is something useful here in the prediction interval. Uh, from the assumption of normally distributed residuals, you're able to get these intervals that fully incorporate all forms of uncertainty in the problem. They incorporate uncertainty about the likely deviation of a future case from the line. Uh, you know, you've got the systematic part. How big is the likely random component going to be? That's the residual. So they incorporate residual uncertainty. And much more subtly, they incorporate uncertainty about parameters. Because there's a sampling distribution for beta naught, there's a sampling distribution for beta 1 hat, this is the intercept and slope of the least squares estimate. Uh, that uncertainty trickles forward into uh, uncertainty about predictions. Uh, and this prediction interval that we've calculated here has all of that uncertainty uh, baked into it. All right, so just to reemphasize what we've learned here, uh, we've used the assumption of normally distributed residuals, uh, which I, I've sort of emphasized here on page 103 of the course packet. And we've seen how to use, uh, first of all, the summary function, which I'm scrolling back up to the top here. Uh, the summary function of a linear model, which will spit out both estimates and standard errors derived from that normality assumption. And then with a little bit of extra work, we've been able to split a data set into two cases, a training set to use to estimate the model and a testing set used to generate predictions. Uh, and we've used the predict function to put all that together to calculate a non-naive prediction interval. 
Uh, so that's uh, useful practice uh, for when you see new data and want to make predictions.